I want to ask you to turn with me to what is now a familiar portion of Scripture. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 6. You would just park at verse 10 for a moment. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, if you will park there. I want to share with you out of the word of the Lord. I want to inform the church again that uh, death has visited our extended church family. Uh, we're praying this morning for our sister Norma. Amen. Praise God. Turnbull, who amen, lost her younger sister. Uh, her younger sister. Sister Norma, just stand so folk know who I'm talking about because with the mask, you know, it gets a little challenging. Amen. Y'all pray for Sister Norma. Amen. Praise God as she is dealing with having to participate and help with the uh, celebration of life for her younger sister. Come on, let's put our hands together and encourage her so she know we love her. I'm always tickled when people are grieving, but they're still in church. It tells me that they are mature enough to separate their hurt, amen, praise God, from their praise. And so they realize that if I can do that, I can cause an anointing to create a healing where I hurt. Some people, folks are immature and they stay away from God when they're hurting. Which doesn't make any sense because he's a healer. It's like being sick, brothers, and saying, I ain't going to the doctor because I'm sick. <laughs> it just don't make any kind of sense. He's a healer, and he heals us when we're hurt. There's a song, a praise, a worship, a dance, a hand clap that you do in those moments when you're hurting that heals the sorrows, that takes away the pain, that that gives you a praise in the middle of what you would be a panic moment. But you've learned in the midst of, amen, praise God, everything that you're going through, how to give God a real praise. So we praise God for our sister Norma and being in here. I want to also remind you again, uh, uh, that same deceased is also sister-in-law to our deacon Mike Jones. And so, amen, praise God. And if you didn't know it, so that makes Turnbull and Deacon Jones Amen, family. So we pray for them even in this season and uh, as they make preparation. Amen, praise God, to deal with that. I want to thank those of you who pressed your way out on Wednesday to uh, help us uh, celebrate our, amen, co-founder and person, person of Mother Garbert who aided in the start of Tree United Church. And of a fact, you had a chance, if you were here, to hear what I always say, I'm working somebody else's vision. I'm working somebody else's vision because I didn't start this. The Lord just called me to carry it on. And I'm a big good steward over what God has called me to do. I believe that uh, some of my rewards in heaven is tied into what I do here on earth. And I'm trying to be a good steward over what God has put in my hands to do. Because I read the story of the talents. <laughs> I read it real good, and so I want to be a good steward over what God has gifted us. I do want to issue some caution as you can begin to prepare and get ready for Thanksgiving that this year is going to be different. And some folks are thinking of creative ways to still have virtual dinners and, and broadcast it on, tele, on their television screens so it's big enough for the family to see the other family distant eating at the same table. Some are sharing kitchen experience as they prepare the meal. We're going to have to get creative this year. We're going to have to get creative. It's not going to be the same, but God is still worthy of all the praises. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so uh, uh, whatever you do, I want to caution you because the two weeks after Thanksgiving is going to be critical. It's going to be critical. Some school districts have already starting to prepare for that by going virtual during that whole period to ensure that the kids don't carry stuff back to the classroom and ultimately infect other people. So uh, we want to we wanna, we wanna really give some thought this year, give some thought this year. As a church, amen, praise God, we're going to be, we're gonna be very diligent about our screening and our social distancing over that two-week period because none of us are exempt. None of us are exempt. 
And so all of us are going to have to take extra caution, and we're going to have to exercise real caution as we gather. Amen? Amen. All right. Amen. Praise God. All right. I want to take you to the word of the Lord this morning, and I want to, uh, and Brother Kishore, you're going to have to help me with these slides. I want to ask you to turn your attention to the book of Ephesians, the 6th chapter and the 10th verse. I want to lift up in your hearing from the verses, verses 10 through 20, uh, as I conclude this message, I want to entitle this particular installment, The Believer's Battle. And I'm, when I say that, I'm referring to the final battle of every, the believers. Uh, each believer, uh, amen, praise God, is involved in a personal battle. You're going to see that in a few minutes. The Bible says here in Ephesians, Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, the 6th chapter and 10 verse, and he says, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the end, the devil. And we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, withstand the, in the evil day. And having done all to stand, to stand. Stand therefore having your loins girded about with truth and having the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and above all things amen taking the shield of faith wherewith ye are able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god praying always with all prayers and supplication in the spirit watching thereto uh, thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Notice this, for all saints. And for me, the utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mysteries of the gospel. For I'm an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I uh, ought to speak. May the Lord have his richest blessing upon the reading of his holy words. We declare it in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen. I want to talk to you, and uh, Brother Kishore, you're going to have to help me through these slides. And uh, I want to help our members. I'm going to slow walk this for a little bit, then we're going to get to uh, our main points. But I want to talk to you about the believer's battle. How many of y'all know that everybody's in a battle, in a battle, in a battle? And part of that idea has to permeate our relationship and our walk with God. It has to trickle down in every aspect of our lives, and amen, praise God, it's got to show up in everything that we do. Uh, go slide by slide for me, sir. Amen, praise God. It's got to show up in everything that we do. Uh, and so the idea is, in, in, in the first week, I started, at, I entitled the message, amen, praise God, making sense of your struggle. And the reason I entitled it Making Sense of Your Struggle is because I want everybody to know that everyone sitting next to them is struggling with something because it's a battle. And so it doesn't make sense for us to criticize somebody else's struggle when you've got one too. It doesn't even make sense to, to put down somebody else because they are faltering with their struggle when the truth is you're faltering with yours too. I wish I had a church in here. Y'all getting quiet on me, but we're going to get there after a while. And so all of us are struggling, amen, praise God, with something. And if all of us are struggling with something, then Bishop, how can I be saved and be in a struggle? And so uh, during this message, I want to show you how that's possible. And that you can be anointed and still have struggles. The second thing I want you to know, and uh, we said this in that previous message, amen, and making sense of your struggle, is that the church is not a, amen, praise God, a showboat. Uh, the show, some folks want to make the church a showboat, but it really is the church is a battleship. It's a battleship. And like every other battleship, it, got, it has, it is manned by faulty hands. Which means the folk working around you in the church all have their own issues. Come on, somebody. 
Yeah? And that's why we celebrate each other's anointing. Amen. Praise God. Because the truth of the matter, if it wasn't for the anointing, I, it, I would be disqualified by being able to stand before you to even speak the word of God. Mm -hmm. My sins would disqualify me. And so the church is a battleship, and part of being a battleship is not only hand, uh, manned by faulty hands, but, amen, praise God, is manned by scarred bodies. In other words, you've got a scar, I've got a scar, all of us have battle scars as evidence that we've been through some things since we've been saved. Oh, Lord, have mercy. We've been through some things since we have been saved. What do you mean, preacher? Amen. Praise God. I told you in that, in, that particular, in that particular lesson, amen, praise God, making sense of the struggle that some of us, amen, praise God, are struggling because of our carnality. Come on, tell, tell the truth. You've, you've got flesh issues, you've got sin issues, and you're struggling because of your carnality. Somebody say carnality. Paul says, in me, amen, praise God, dwelleth no good thing. In fact, amen, praise God, I find in me a law of fighting against the law of my own mind trying to bring me into captivity. When I desire to do good, my flesh is trying to override me. Anybody in here got some flesh issues every now and then that just seem like you have flesh back and you've got to fight back? Tell the truth. It's not all about singing and shouting. It, it looks good when you're dancing and worshiping and praising. But when you get out of church, you got to live this thing called church. You got to live it. You got to live it. You got to learn how to live what you've been living. And so all of us are dealing with a struggle. Amen. Praise God. And so critical is that struggle. Amen. Praise God. Uh, the second thing is, is not only some people are struggling because of their carnality, but other folks are struggling. Amen. Because of their choices. Some of us have made bad choices. And as a result, amen. Praise God. There are areas of our life that is jacked up because of your choices. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Every now and then you, 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 and I said it on the funeral on Wednesday and I did it, that there are stages in life when you're, the first is your innocence, when you just, you know, you're naive to everything. Now, in those teenage years and 20 years, you don't even know what you don't know. Amen. Praise God. And then you move from that area of innocence and into a, an era, a second stage of investigation where you're just trying to find out things in life and find out where you stand and find out what you can achieve and find Find out is the, is, the, is the theme of your life. You're just trying to know. But then you get to a point where life issues you from, takes you from just being inspired to some real deals. And all of a sudden, amen, praise God, some of the things you thought were possible are, not, are not, no longer possible or wasn't possible to begin with. You realize, amen, praise God, all of us got limitations and you move from the real deal to regrets. And by the time you get to the regrets in your life, amen, you're at the stage of your life where you're looking back over your life and seeing some things you regret happened the way you did. Uh -huh. You wish you could change some things. You wish you had made different choices with some things. You did wish you had navigated, but you can't go back and correct it. You can only go forward with your life. I wish I had some praises in here. And that's why, and so you go from regretting to learning how to repent. I wish I had some. You, you, you start saying, God, I, I'm sorry for what I did and how I did it. The choices I made. I, I can't live in a place called regrets. So I learned how to repent, repent so I can set my soul free from the bondage of sin that would hold me bound. Do I have a witness out here? I don't know how folk don't believe in repentance. Because repentance, true repentance sets you free. Gets rid of the regrets, and all of a sudden, you can walk through life with your head held up and your steps high. I got to fight this fight. Some of it is because of my carnality. Others of it is because of the choices I make. Uh, sometimes, in the, the first minute I told you, some of us are struggling because, amen, praise God, not only the choices, but we are struggling because of our Christ-likeness. Let me tell you something. I had to find this out by myself. We as Christians declare certain, a high set of values that nobody else prescribed to. 
We say to ourselves, I'm going to live, amen, praise God, celibate in a society that has gone sick. I wish I had somebody else. And, and, and folk look at you funny when you telling them, amen, praise God, I'm going to be celibate until I find the right person. They look at you crazy because they can't even imagine that they could live that way. And if the truth be told, you couldn't imagine yourself living that way at one time. But thanks be to God who has caused you to prosper and triumph. In an area of your life called your flesh. You know that if your flesh rules you, you will find yourself in situations that you don't even know how to get yourself out of. So the Christ-likeness is, 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 is a burden, but it's a blessing. It protects you from some things. There are some things you never go through and experience in life because of your Christ-likeness. And so it's a blessing, amen, praise God. But some of us are suffering, amen, praise God, because, amen, I've decided to live for Jesus. I've decided, amen, praise God, if I've got to live single the rest of my life, I'm still going to live holy. Oh, we get quiet in here because that's not the message we traditionally hear across our television screens. But can I suggest to you, that's the message of the Bible. That's the message of the Bible. Be he holy, because I am holy. So our Christ-likeness makes me prescribe to beliefs and values nobody else does. Sometimes our Christ-likeness causes us, amen, when we'd want to tell somebody off mm -hmm, and be justified in doing it, our Christ-likeness says you're going to poison the witness. So the, the hold your peace, hold your peace. Anybody in here, God ever, the Holy Ghost ever said, hold your peace, hold your peace. And, 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 and your mouth almost slipped, but you took it back. You controlled your own vocabulary and verbosity. And said, Lord, I'm just going to walk. I could have, but I won't. And you find so much victory when you're able to walk away from stuff you're used to. So sometimes we're dealing with choices, amen, but sometimes we're doing our Christ-like behavior and beliefs that cause us. But then sometimes we're persecuted for our Christ-like behavior. Behavior. And I had to learn this the hard way because sometimes, amen, praise God, amen, the devil attacks you at work because of your Christ-like behavior. He attacks you in an area of your life, sometimes with your family, because you need approval from those folks. And sometimes you feel like the odd person because of your Christ-like behavior because they're doing stuff or involved in stuff that you aren't involved in. And so, and so your Christ-like behavior make you stand out and you realize as a Christian you have to be comfortable being the odd person. I believe that any Christian who is not comfortable standing out can't be a Christian at all. Jesus never blended in. Jesus, amen, though he was able to sit in and stand in among sinners, amen, as well as saints, he never blended. You can't lose you trying to please everybody else. Sometimes you're going to have to call it for what it is. And then add, I just don't believe that, but I don't judge you. you God going to be judge of us all. Those are the choices, those are the Christ-like behaviors, those are the things that will often bring you to the place, amen, praise God, where, and I, and I said in that message, you got to make sense of why you are struggling, why you are struggling. Uh, the, the last point I want to uh, point out is that sometimes you are struggling because, amen, create your Christ-like image. Let me say this, the devil, when he is trying to get at God, he attacks you because like Jesus, you are the express image of God in the earth realm. Y'all don't hear me because if he can poison your, somebody's view of your Christianity, he can poison their view of your God. I wish I had some. I don't know about you, but I hold myself accountable not to do anything, amen, praise God, that poisons my witness for God. I, I don't want somebody seeing my weakness and, amen, judging God based on my, I'll be the first to admit I'm weak where God is strong. Don't judge, don't look at me and judge God. 
I got issues just like everybody else, but I'm saved. I'm sanctified. I'm Holy Ghost filled. I'm fire baptized, and I'm running for my life. Do I have a witness in here? Ah, uh, hey. And so it's important that all of us, amen, praise God, who are going through these things realize, amen, praise God, that, amen, uh, we've got those reasons that we are struggling. Uh, the second thing that I want you to know, amen, praise God, that as Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, he says, but if you're going to be strong in the Lord, amen, praise God, which suggests that in spite of those things I just listed, there is a possibility for believers to be strong. He, he suggests that, amen, you ought not to settle for your weakness. You ought not to give yourself a count out because you found yourself with some issues. But you ought to know that you can rise above your situation. Do I have a witness in here tonight? And so Paul begins to let us know, amen, that you can be strong in the Lord and in the power of of his might. Now, he suggests that uh, if you're going to be strong in the Lord, amen, realize it's not going to be because of your power, uh, but you're going to have to learn to seek a power greater than yourself. Can I get a witness out there? Can I get a witness online? In other words, amen, well, that's why saints are so obsessed with feeling the anointing. That's why we're so obsessed with experiencing the power of his anointing. Because I realize, uh, amen, you don't have to tell me when I'm running empty. You don't have to tell me when I'm, my batteries seem a little drained. You don't have to tell me when I'm feeling not like myself in the anointing. Honey, the spirit of the Lord that's on the inside begins to tell me it's time to fill up. And a red light goes on in my spirit. And don't you know that sometimes when you see me worshiping and see me praising and it looks like I've lost my mind, it's not because of the drums it's not because of the keyboard it's not because of the guitar it's because i feel something in my spirit that says partly you need to make a deposit in the anointing and my praise releases my power oh lord i feel like preaching here i feel like preaching in here and so all of us have got to get to the point now where amen praise god we are Amen. Realize, Paul says, it's not going to be based on your power. It's going to be based purely, amen, praise God, on his power. So I'm seeking more of him. I'm striving to be more like him. I'm striving to achieve what God has set out for me to achieve. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but I've come to the conclusion, friend, that church is more than a shout. It's more than a dance. It's, it's more than a showboat. It's a battlefield, and I realize I'm on a battlefield for the Lord. And if I die, let me die. But I come to give God the praise in the midst of my situation. Mm. Watch this. The uh, second thing I want to say to you, and the second part of this message, was that the devil, amen, praise God, is not only, amen, praise God, amen, trying to fight us. And Paul says there's a way to be strong. But he says if you plan to be strong, the first thing you have to do is know your adversary. And that's the, that's the problem is some folk have been studying people, but they ain't studying the devil. And can I suggest that you take your eyes off of people and put it on a real devil? He's strategic. The Bible says in the book of Job, in the first chapter, he says that, amen, the devil, amen, said to God, I've been going to and fro, seeking, amen, praise God, who I may devour. He's been busy watching you. He's watched you, Esther, in your high moments, and he watches you in your low moments, and he knows the triggers that get you down. He knows what makes you depressed. He knows what makes you lonely. He knows what makes you empty. He knows what makes you feel like you're defeated. And the devil, who is your adversary, is seeking to sift you like wheat. He is strategic. Somebody holler strategic. I said to you, your wife and husbands, but he don't attack you the same way. I thank God for that because I'm going to need her to be strong when I'm weak. 
if both of us are under the same attack and if both of us are a, a, a total mess, who's going to run the house? Who's going to keep things in charge? Who's going to keep walking forward? I need somebody to be weak when I'm strong. And then, Lord, teach me how to submit in the moments of my weakness. I wish I had a church. I feel like I'm preaching better than you shouting. He is strategic. And once you start to study the devil, you know what the devil is going to use against you. You know your own weakness. Can I prove it to you? Paul says, Paul says, amen, I got a buffet, an instrument of Satan. Amen, praise God, who has buffeted me and prevented me, amen, praise God, from being all that I could be. He said, I'm not even going to tell you what it is because if I told you, you may judge me. So I'm going to call it a buffet from Satan himself. Can I tell you this? Can I tell you this? Can I, I realize the less we know about people of God, the better off we are. I want to know nothing but you saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost and running for your life. That's all I need to know. Amen. Praise God. But Paul says, I got a buffet. I got something going on in me. Amen. And I had to approach God multiple times for deliverance. Uh, can I tell you this? You can't give up on asking God for your deliverance. Sometimes it's your buffet that keeps you humble. It's your buffet that keeps you broken. It's your buffet that prevents you from being exalted beyond measure. It's your buffet that makes you trust the anointing. It's your buffet that keeps you at your feet. It's your buffet that keeps you in prayer. It's your buffet that makes you fast. It's your buffet that makes you last. I know it's true. Paul said, I prayed about this buffet. And all I heard in my spirit was, my grace is sufficient. God says, my anointing can keep you. My anointing can sustain you. He said, I got to let you stumble sometimes so you don't get exalted above yourself. Ooh, the devil is strategic. The devil is strategic. The devil is strategic. And I also reminded you that the devil is strong. But he's not stronger than God. Now the reason, watch this, watch this, watch this evangelist pie. The reason we declare the devil is strong. Can I tell you why? Listen real good, real good. It's not really because he's that strong. Here's why. Here's why. He only attacks you in the area of your weakness. It, if he attacks you in your strength, you would buff up and say, no way you can take me, devil. You're not that strong. But he attacks you in the area of your weakness. And I don't know about you, but I came from the streets before coming into the church. And anybody who kicks you when you're down is because they're a coward. I wish I had somebody in here. I wish I had some ex-fighters in here. He kicks you when you're down because he's a coward, not because he's strong. He attacks you in your area of weakness. So when he's attacking your weakness, you need to get up in your strength. Look the devil face to face. I said, devil, I will arise. I will arise and come out of this situation. I wish I had a praise. I put those hands together and praise God all over this house. He attacks you in your weakness because, uh, because he's trying to declare he's strong. He attacks you. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Not only because he's uh, strategic and because he appears to be strong, but I want you to know the Bible says he is spiritual. Somebody say spiritual. He's spiritual. Can I tell you this? Amen. Praise God. He is spiritual. Now, can I say this? The Bible, when you read, amen, praise God, about the devil before his fall, the Bible said he was created, amen, praise God, amen, not only to be a praise angel, Amen, praise God. But he was created to be the highest of the praise angels. As he was created, his whole body gave God praise. That's why he gets mad when your body give God some praise. But no matter what I'm feeling in my body or how I'm feeling, I will bless the Lord at all times. Do I have some praisers who believe that and hold that as a value? I don't let the devil make sickness talk me out of my praise. In fact, the sicker I feel is the more I want to praise God. The more, 
out of myself I feel is the more I want to praise God in myself. I wish I had a praiser in here. I come by to tell somebody, oh hallelujah, that I can praise God in spite of everything that's going on. Now, do I have a witness in here? Because the, the devil ever figure out that when you are sick, you don't praise him. He'll keep you sick. He'll keep you depressed. He'll keep you busted and disgusted. But when he discovers, when he sees for himself that you will worship God in spite of, in the midst of, regardless of, that you still have a praise, it makes him want to back up. Do I have a witness in here? I come to praise God with everything that I have in me. Oh, hallelujah. Now, not only is he strategic, not only is he, uh, amen, praise God strong, and not only, Lord have mercy, is he spiritual, but the Bible says, uh, amen, praise God, in his spirituality, every angel was created with hierarchy, and in the hierarchy of angel, God created Satan to have dominions and thrones and majesty. He was a high-ranking angel that had jurisdiction over other angels can I tell you this that's why when he went against God amen the angels followed him you got to be careful who you're following when they have lost the presence of God you've got to be careful who you're following when they have lost focus on God you've got to be careful who you are trying to be like when they're no longer following God I have learned and told people for years if I stop following God, you have my permission to step over me. But keep on following Jesus. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Which means if I stop following him, you got permission not to follow me. Secondly, know your adversary. Just know your adversary. But secondly, not only know your adversary, but he goes one step further. And, so, and said, know your armor. <laughs> know your armor. Paul says here in the church, he says in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able, amen, praise God, to withstand. Now the word withstand means that you're going to be under attack. Which means there's some stuff, uh, amen, that you're going to have to learn how to deal with. I wish I had some ability to talk to each other. I tell you to tell your neighbor, toughen up. I'm sick of weak Christians. I'm sick of, amen, praise God, uh, puny Christians. I'm sick of, amen, praise God, uh, girly Christians. Can I, can I use that uh, phrase? Uh, uh, amen, praise God. Paul Peter, amen, praise God. First Peter 4 and 10 says, amen, you, you can't act like it's something strange has happened when you come on the attack. Uh, but because, you see, some of us made the church an entertainment center. Uh, oh, hallelujah. We made the church an entertainment boat. Uh, and so, amen, praise God, it's all about how you feel. But sometimes you're going to have to follow God even when you don't feel it. Can I talk to somebody in here? It's not about how the praise team makes you feel. Because sometimes the truth be told, they're going through their own stuff. And they can barely get their own praise on. So if you don't feel them, you still got to have obligation to praise your God. You can't use them as the reason you're not strong in the Lord and walking in the power of his might. Watch this. He says, know your armor, man. Know your armor. That you can have a dealing with a strategic devil. And he says, as a result, in verse, in, amen, praise God, 11, you got to put on the whole armor so that you can withstand. In verse 12, he says, for you wrestle not against flesh and blood. In other words, he reminds us that this fight that we're in, amen, praise God, is not against each other. Amen, praise God. He reminds us that this fight we're in is not against a husband and a wife. It's not against children and parents. It's not against family members or friends. He says, don't not be mistaken though. Amen. Why did he have to say it's not against flesh and blood? He says, because sometimes the devil will use flesh and blood to attack you. Some folks are on the devil's payroll and don't even know it. The devil is using them 
to frustrate you, using them to fatigue you, using them to get at you. Can I tell you something? And sometimes they are purely just being used without their knowledge. The man who was in, amen, Gardera, amen, by the city behind the walls, amen, he had been left there alone but still possessed by devils. Can I talk to you, somebody? Sometimes the devil will use whoever he can to get to you, and oftentimes it's going to be somebody close to you because somebody who is not close to you can't affect you. Can I talk to you? You got to learn how to look past Peter. Oh God. I said, Peter, I hear you talking, but it's not you I'm getting ready to rebuke. I'm getting ready to rebuke the devil that's using you to try to get to me. Hello, somebody. If you don't know, the devil will use Malik to get to you because who else will bother you? Who else is close enough to get on your nerve? Can I talk to somebody in here? You got to know when the devil is using somebody and you got to be like Jesus, Satan, the Lord rebukes you. Satan, the Lord rebukes you. Satan, the Lord rebukes you. Can I talk to somebody? He said, your battle is not with flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers. Now, pause. I have read that a hundred times, and what I did not realize in reading that, I know what it meant here, but I needed to look a little deeper. Amen. Praise God. Mother Turnbull, I found out that when, amen, angels were created, there are hierarchy of angels. And in the hierarchy of angels, there are archangels and angels that were given principalities over and powers over regions. Now, so when God created the angels, it was to be his messenger. And he does have messenger and angels assigned to regions and territories. They have prince, they have powers and authorities over that region. Now hear me. So when one third of God's angel fell on the devil's side, mm -hmm, they switched leaders. But they still were operating in the jurisdiction they were assigned to. Can I talk to somebody in here? And so you've got devils that are uh, over the United States. You've got devils, Lord have mercy, <laughs> over other regions and over cities and over countries and counties uh, that operate in certain spirits uh, and certain spiritual realm. Can I talk to you, somebody? Uh, mm, now, let me take it where you live. Uh, and the Bible says he created, amen, common angels, uh, another hierarchy, and he shall give those angels charge over you. Uh, so there, when, uh, when the common angels fail on the devil's side, one or two that were assigned to be your charge uh, have now become, hey, Lord, have mercy, a buffet in your flesh. Uh, can I talk to somebody in here? You wonder sometimes why you have no peace. Uh, you wonder where is your joy. Uh, you wonder sometimes why you're so short-tempered and why you're so quick to respond. What's going on with me? There's an angel, a buffet of Satan himself, who was assigned to your charge that is buffeting you. Read it for yourself. It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. And see, he said, he says, principalities and powers. Can I take it one step further? Can I take some? That's why the Bible teaches this principle. He says, Paul says, nothing shall separate me from the love of God. Neither height, nor debt, nor principalities, nor powers. Hold on, Paul. He goes right back here and pick up this same text. Lord have mercy. And says, I recognize that there are jurisdictional demons that are in the battle with me. And not because I can't see them, don't make them real. You ever wake up sometime and just be miserable and cross and angry and amen, praise God. You don't even know why you feel the way you do. Amen, praise God. But you feel like you're in a war within your own self. Can I talk to somebody? That's why I need the Holy Ghost. That's why you need a worship life outside of church. Because in those moments, you need to say, come here, Jakai. Hayes. Come here. Come. Amen. You need to put on the right song in the right moment that you can get your praise on. And if all you ever praise God is in church, when you have your battle at home, you won't know what to do. But you got to have a praise life in spite of church. Because when they close the doors to the church, I can still bless the Lord at all times. Stay with me. Yeah. 
Sometimes you don't know this, but you need to say, get behind me, Satan. And folk will like, look at you crazy, but they don't know what you know. That I'm struggling with something. I'm fighting with something. Sometimes your children, Lord have mercy, just act outside of themselves. And you start wondering what the world is going on. It's like they became something different. And all you can say, the blood, the blood, the blood. You see, real mature trains. That's why I like the old school saints. The old school saints didn't come to church to be seen in a shout. They came to church to shout and let the devil know, I got the victory. I got the victory. I got the the victory I got the victory I wish I had a church in here too many new saints come to church to be seen but I would rather the devil see me and know and be able to say Paul I know and Jesus I know and I sure know you too I wish I had a church folk in here I gotta work my way through this text please let me go finish not only the adversary but you must know the armor he says here's the armor that you gotta put on he said, the first thing that you need to do, amen, is put on the belt, put on the belt of truth. And let me say this, and I, I shared with you last week, that he meant the truth of God's word, not your truth. Because I have heard people say, I know the Bible says this, but this is what I believe. Well, I don't care what you believe. I'm not trying to go to your heaven. Last I checked, in fact, you ain't got a heaven or hell to put me in. I want to be what God says I'm going to be and do what God says is all right. I want to please God, to be honest. And so it's important that you have the truth. Amen. Praise God. Amen. And, and, and when you have the truth of God, we're now, it, it, I, I said to you last time that the Paul was actually tied to a Roman soldier in imprisonment and he was looking at the soldier's armors and God gave him a word. Have you ever been in a bad situation and God speak to you? In fact, I love it when God speaks to me in some bad situation because sometimes it's my inspiration. He speaks to him and gives him a word out of his predicament. He takes him outside of it and shows him the soldier and he says, look at his belt. And in his belt, amen, he's got the truth of God's word. But the belt for the Roman soldier held also all of his equipment. Everything was attached to the belt. Can I tell you this? If you don't love the truth of God's word, it don't matter how much you praise him. It's not attached to the truth of God's word. It don't matter how much you dance on the dance ministry if you don't love the truth of God's word. Because it's not attached to anything truth would bring. You've got to love God's word to the point when you do wrong, his word convict you. You've got to love God's word where you say it's like, David, even if I'm the one in sin, amen, God's word is still right. You've got to love the truth of God's word. Somebody say truth. Amen. Praise God. The truth of God's word, amen, praise God, becomes that belt to which we can hold on to. Now, can, can, let me go one step further. I said to you last time there were seven particular armors. Amen, praise God. Most people count six because they missed the seventh one, which is critical. He said, listen, gird about yourself with some truth. Amen, praise God. Having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, the second thing he says is that not only do you need the truth of God's word, but you need to guard your chest, your heart with righteousness. Guard your heart with righteousness. Can I tell you this? We got some folks with belts on. They got Louis and Gucci's and what's that H1? Uh, whatever that one is. Uh, how you know? How you know? You must, be, you must have one too. Hey, they got all those belts, but they forget the belt of truth. And so they dress for the world, but they ain't dressed for the battle. If you can't say amen, say ouch, it's still true. You look good on the outside, but on the inside, the devil sees an opportunity. Because you're not walking with the belt of truth. Secondly, he says, put on your breastplate of righteousness. In other words, you can be dressed from head to toe with the right jacket, the right shirt, the right suit. But if you don't have on the breastplate, my friend, it means your heart is exposed. And can I tell you what I've learned about me? That when my heart is overwhelmed, I'm in trouble. Yeah, when my heart becomes emotional, I can't function. 
I, in my heart is offended. I can't have peace with the people of God. I can't even receive ministry when my heart is overwhelmed or offended. So well, my ladies and gentlemen, saints of the most high God, you got to learn how to guard your heart in this battle. If you're going to make it, if you're going to stand, if you're going to withstand, you got to have to learn to guard your heart. And he says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. In other words, it's right living and right standard in the word of God that keeps you emotionally checked. He says, if you, you get dressed as a saint but don't have on the breastplate, it won't be long before your heart, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It won't be long because out of the heart comes the issues of life. It won't be long before your life will take a whole different direction because your heart is wounded. Mm. May I suggest that every time you become so offended that you can't come to church, it's because the devil has attacked you in an area you didn't have your breastplate on. I know that it's so difficult to, to, to grasp because the truth of the matter is we have raised up sensationalism in the church. Everybody now comes to church to feel good. I remember as a boy coming to church, they told me some days you ought to leave church feeling bad because it wasn't about coming to feel good. We treat church like it's a next high, but church is not about the next high. It's become grounded and, and built up in the word of truth so that when the devil attacks you, amen, you can say, Satan, amen, praise God, it is written, thou shalt not. You can't say that if you don't have the truth. It's got to be in your heart. The psalm is declared, that word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. And so I'm working my way through this text because we're in a crazy season now. With this pandemic, I may suggest to you one third of the people who call themselves saints will not make it by the end of 2021. Because of what has happened in 2020. I'm going to tell you that. The question becomes, will you be a statistic? And the reason they won't make it is because they don't have on the whole armor. They got pieces of it on and they feel like the pieces they have on justifies their position. But the truth of the matter is you can't withstand without the whole armor. And Paul made a statement of strength by saying you're going to need the whole armor to stand. It's the only reason I'm taking three weeks to go through this because I need each of us to see where we are in this. He says not only is there the breastplate of righteousness, but he says, listen, amen, praise God, verse 15, and make sure your feet is shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. He says, how does the devil attack you when you don't have on the right shoes. I celebrated my 50th birthday, 55th birthday, and I was in Europe knowing that before that, and I knew I was going to have a special day, and I bought a pair of shoes in Europe. I ain't going to tell nobody how much I paid because I'm still repenting. And it's not good to confess when you're repenting. You only need to confess to God. It's all right. I'm glad y'all making me feel better. I don't feel better though. <laughs> and, 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 and that shoe only wore it once. Don't plan to wear it no time soon because I'm waiting on the next occasion because I pay too much for it to wear it every time. But here's why that is important. Because this gospel shoe is the shoe that is attached to your peace. Mm -hmm. In other words, you will know you're not wearing your gospel shoe when you don't have peace. Oh yes, you may have the belt and you may have the breastplate. But when you've lost your peace of a saint, amen, it's because you don't wear your right shoe. 
You may come in the nice shoe you bought, but do you have your gospel shoe on? It is the gospel shoe. Amen. Praise God. And so it's an important part of the art of the of the armor of the believer. When you understand that you're in a battle, you not only put on your nice shoe, but you put on your gospel shoe. Amen. And sometimes you put it on over your nice shoe. Amen. Praise God. Amen. So the feet of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. And I need the gospel of peace to follow me everywhere I go. Because when the devil is after your peace, you won't have peace at home. You won't have it on the job. You won't have it in the classroom. You won't have it in the friends. You won't have it in the den. You won't have it in the basement. He said, this is the gospel of peace. So therefore, he attacks you by robbing you of peace. And that's how you know you don't have the shoes on. See, it's not based on how much you shout and dance. It's these critical spiritual truths hidden in the text that tell you don't have no peace. And I have seen people dressed in nice clothes who look ugly because they don't have peace. I have seen folks in fancy cars who don't have peace. I've seen people with money in the bank and they don't have peace. Can I tell you this? And the people who have peace don't have peace have a war with everybody. They got a problem with everybody. They, got a, they, they, they have an issue with everybody because they themselves don't have, they don't have no peace. Not peace with God, peace with self, and then ultimately peace with saints. He says, listen, put on this gospel shoe. And I tell you this, he not only attacks your peace, but he attacks, attacks the, pre the spreading of the gospel. He, how does he do it, preacher? He demotivates believers from sharing the gospel. You know you don't have no gospel shoes when you don't have a desire to even share the gospel. Can, can I say that? You know you don't have a gospel shoe when you have no desire to share the gospel. Uh, it, it feels like a burden for you to even share the gospel. You, have, you take no occasion by which you share the gospel. So he kills the motivation of the spreader. But not only does he kill the motivation of the spreader to show that you don't have no shoes, he also dilutes the spread. Stay with me. He demotivates the spreader, but he dilutes the spread. So he says, even if you're spreading when you don't have no shoes on, oh Lord, you ever tried walking in a field without shoes? I grew up in Jamaica. And every now and then I try to be tough and get out there without shoes. I can't l walk comfortable in the field without a shoe. The same thing is true with your gospel message. When you don't have the gospel on, you dilute where you spread the gospel. You dilute how you say it. You start to make be people's feelings become more important than the fact of his word. You don't have a shoe on. So, oh yes, you drop some seed. But it's not as potent as before. You worship, but you're not as strong as before. You praise, but you're not as excited as before. Something has gone wrong. He demotivates the spreader, but he dilutes the spread. You drop a little here and a little there. And guess what? The devil knows if this gospel be hid. It is hid from them that are lost. So as long as he got you without the shoe, he can prevent who gets the word. Am I helping anybody because I'm working hard in this text? Let me just finish this armor. He not only got a, deals with the gospel shoe, but he said take the shield of faith. Wherein you may be able to quench the fiery darts. Angel, the sh take this helmet. Helmet. Sorry, sorry. Take this. Take this. The gospel should take this shield of faith. Wherein you're able to quench the fire. Thank you. I just need to get my thought. In other words, the Roman soldier had a big shield. And here's what he saw on the shield. He saw that it was, it was normal for them to put 
an ointment over the shield. That when the fiery darts of the enemy would come, the salve, the thing that was anointing the shield, would out, would put out the fire associated with the darts. So the darts would hit it. And there would be an indentation on the shield to show that it was hit. But it wouldn't catch it on fire. Some of you have scars to prove that you've been in a battle. But your life has not been devoured. Because God would not allow. He kept anointing your shield. And you think your anointing is just to make you shout in church. No, I'm shouting in church because I've discovered that there is an anointing on my shield. And in the middle of the battle, the only thing I have to put up is my shield. Paul says that shield is attached to your faith. It's attached to your faith. So can I tell you this? I got to close. I'm over time. But I want to tell you this. It's attached to your faith, which means... Your ability to hold your shield up is attached to your faith. He attacks the believer's assurance. The believer's certainty in God. He attacks your faith in knowing. So all of a sudden, in the book of Romans says, And we know that all things work together for good. And Coleman, he got you thinking what you're going through cannot be for your good. How can good come out of this? And he attacks and he gnaws at you. And you wake up feeling it. You wake up thinking it. But the truth of the matter is, I don't walk in God because of how I feel. I walk in God because there's a truth around my waist and that's wrapped around my life that's holding my shield up. And it's the truth of knowing that all things, how many of y'all believe that all things work together for good? So really I was talking to somebody yesterday and I said to them, I said, I have to believe that even when I don't understand what the future holds, I know that God is somehow working it for my good. And good is going to come out of this. That all the experiences that I've gone through and is going through and getting ready to go through are going to work together for my good. How many people believe that all over this house? My bad is working for my good. My good is working for my good. I got to close on here. Here's the end of the story. Now Paul says here, here, he says not only do you need that shield, he said, but take the helmet of your salvation. Amen. And the sword of the spirit. Can I tell you this? The helmet covers your mind. Mm -hmm. He covers your mind because he knows that if you ever get outside your mind, Lord have mercy, you're going to be a holy mess. Can I talk to you, somebody? He, he knows that if you ever lose your mind in the middle of this battle, amen, your whole family generation is going down. Huh? Can I talk to you for a second, Howard? Just make it personal. If you ever lose your mind, amen, praise God, he's not only just wiping you out, he's taking your whole family out. Can I talk to you, somebody? So you got to guard your mind. You got to do everything to guard it with all diligence. Uh, amen, praise God. You got to hold on to your head sometimes. Uh, you you got to cry in the dark and say, God, wipe away the tears from my eye. Because when I get out of this shower, I got to be a whole different person. Do I have a witness out there? I got the clothes. He says, you got to take this whole helmet of your salvation and put it over your head so that there is sozo. There's that healing that falls on your mind. He says, not only that, but you need the sword of the spirit. You need your offensive weapon of, uh, amen, praise God, so that you have the this sword of the spirit, amen, so that you can do warfare in the spirit. And I found out, Mother Pie, that's every now and then when my mind is under attack. It is the spirit of the word that comes flowing out of my anointing. And all of a sudden, I hear myself speaking in tongues. Y'all don't hear me. I hear myself speaking in tongues. I can't even interpret what I'm saying, but I hear myself speaking in unknown tongue. And my uh, the understanding of my mind is shut off. It's shut down. Amen. Praise God. But my spirit knows the the deep things of God, huh? knows the mysteries of God, huh? knows what I need to pray in that moment. Huh? And the Spirit bears my infirmities huh? when I don't know what to pray. Huh? The Spirit make it intercession. Huh? Do I have any spirit filled folk in here whose spirit make it intercession huh? with groanings? Huh? and utterances huh? that you don't even know what to say? Somebody say, Glory.
And the Bible says, number seven weapon, and praying with supplication. That's the seventh piece of the weapon, is the prayer life. You can't just have a praise life, you need a prayer life. Can I talk to somebody in here? Pray without ceasing. Pray in good season. Pray in bad season. Pray when you're happy. Pray when you're sad. Pray when you're hurting. Pray when you're humble. Pray when you're up. And pray when you're down. Do I have a witness in here? He said prayer with all supplication and intercession. Not only for yourself, but pray for the saints, Paul said. He said, listen here. No, you got some allies. No, you got some people praying for you when they don't see you. No, there's some folks standing in the gap for you. Telling the devil, devil, if you're going to get her, you're going to have to pass through me. I'm done. I'm done. I, I know this has been lengthier than I planned, but I wanted to get it in your head. Because I believe we're going to have to preserve these truths for the next six months of this second wave. I believe it's not going to be easy. I believe that there is a distinct possibility that church doors again will be closed for months. Amen. Praise God. And we're going to have to survive. And you're going to see who's really on the Lord's side. Hello, somebody. You're going to have to deter, you're going to see for yourself whose faith can endure. We're bracing ourselves. We're bracing ourselves. But the truth of God's word said, if my people that are called by my name would humble themselves and pray. So even while I brace, my faith looks up to thee. O Lamb of Calvary, Savior divine, hear me while I pray. Take all this stuff away. Give me your peace that passeth all understanding. Give me your peace that passeth all my fears. Somebody put your hand together and praise God. I'm done. I'm done. I'm close. I'm going to close with this. Last night, and my wife's here. Last night, Vengeance Pie, Aunt, Aunt Pie. Deacon Wilford, last night my son, Chad, ran in the room and he was all excited. I said, what, what, Chad? Oh, Chad gets excited, he gets excited. You're quiet every other time, right? He gets excited and he, he said, he said, Ella Handy, he ran, he said, Dad, I've never had this many views on TikTok. I said, okay, you excited about TikTok, all right. What, 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 what they looking at? He said, Dad, I don't know how to explain this to you. I said, well, to try. <laughs> I ain't that dumb, right? Just try. He said that I posted the things that people don't know or wouldn't agree is sin. He said I put my dog's face on the, but I put in the caption the things people won't don't know or would agree is sin, but it is sin. And then he lists the first one idolatry and then on the TikTok he defined what idolatry is and he says anything that takes the place of God in your life is idolatry I said Chad where you get that from that sounds familiar he said I I was sitting on the bench dad when you were preaching it and I remember what you said and then the second one he said is he said and a gay lifestyle and he defined it as LGBT, and he went on. And I was afraid to ask him what he knew about that, so I left that one alone. <laughs> I don't know how to get into that conversation, so I said, I'll leave that for his mom to ask. <laughs> he said, Dad, it had 3,500 views in three hours. He said it had literally hundreds of comments, including people who said, you shouldn't force your your beliefs on other folks and he said I responded it's my belief it's your choice <laughs> but it's my belief
He said, Dad, I'm just trying to spread the gospel on TikTok. Ella Handy, I had to guard my heart with righteousness because I've been preaching and sweating and I don't have no 3,500 people in three hours. Malik, I was feeling some kind of way for a moment. Like, maybe I ought to be on TikTok too. You know, I got something to say. You know, I got something to say. You gonna help me? Ask him to help me. <laughs> but can I say this? God is using means to not dilute the spread, but using means to motivate the spreader. Because at 12, he realized he has a desire and a need to spread the gospel. He said it, Dad, out of 400, almost 4,000 views, there's like 150 likes and a few other folks who put thumbs down. And he said, Dad, but I don't care about the thumbs down. Now they know. He said they heard it. They now know they have a choice. I close this message. Now you know. Now you know you have a choice. And for the next six months, get your shoe. Get your breastplate. Get your helmet. Get your sword. Get your shield. Because now you know. Put your hands together and praise God all over this house. I'm done. Thank you, Chad. That really helped me out. I close real strong with that, all right? We just stand to your feet all over this house. This offering time, we're going to close with a giving. If you're in person or online and you do not know the Lord Jesus and the pardon of your sin, here's an opportunity to ask the Lord to come into your life and to save you. See, everything in life starts with a decision. Starts with a decision. Ask the Lord to come into your life. Would you head bowed all over this house? Get your offering together online. If you're not saved, bow your head. If you're not saved, all our saints online or in person are getting their offerings together because they already saved. Getting their offerings and their tithes. But if you're online or in house, would you bow your heads? I'm going to pray with you while they're getting ready to give. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the ministry of songs. The worship team shouted and danced us today. The musician played us and everybody else worked. For the glory of God. But at this moment, God, we come face to face with you. God, if there's somebody in the reach of my voice that is not saved, would you come in today? Convince, convict, and convert. We all need you, Lord Jesus. Time is so quickly running away from us. Destruction and death is in the land. God is in the plan. I sang it as a child, but now we come face to face with it. Save somebody today, Lord. Save a backslider. God, let them recommit back to you, Lord. Save, God, the unchurched or the unsaved, God Jesus. Through the sharing of this video, the sharing of this message, let the unchurched, unsaved come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, God, save. From the uttermost, save, God. Save. Come in today, convince, convict, and convert. I say thank you, Lord, because only you can do that work. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen and amen. If you're in here and in person and you prayed and asked the Lord to come into your life and to save you, and you meant that prayer, if you may say it, prayed it and you meant it, just raise your hand if you're online, amen, praise God, and you prayed that prayer and asked God to come into your life and save you or come into your life and reclaim you. As a backslider, bring you back into right standing. Just raise your hand. You can raise your hand online by just inboxing, inboxing right there on Facebook. You can inbox. You can inbox. No matter when you listen to this video, you can inbox me. We'll return that uh, contact, and we will help walk you through your process of coming and getting in the right standing with God. Anybody in the house or anybody online, all you got to do is identify yourself. We're here to work with you. Somebody brought us in. All of us came from the world into the church. And somebody helped us get in right standing. Is there one today? Is there one? Going once, going twice. 
Is there one online? I'm speaking to you this moment. The next move is yours, is yours. Put those hands together. Let's praise God all over this house. Amen. To our online audience, God bless you. God bless you. Join us this Tuesday night, 7.30 p.m. online. Join us right there on Facebook. Join us on Facebook in the virtual space as we prepare to conclude Revelation chapter 19, sorry, chapter 20 and 21, and then we'll have one chapter after that, 22, and we'll be done with the entire book of Revelation. So join us, 7.30, on Facebook, amen, in our virtual space. You that are in person, if you haven't been joining us, come on, set your alarm, log on, 7.30. There's nothing more important than studying the book of Revelation. We thank God for Pastor Green and Minister Leslie that has been doing the yeoman's task of working through those, that book. And we thank God for your prayer. Let's put our hands together and seal this with a praise, everybody. Heads bowed, hands lifted. May the grace of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest with you, rule with you, and abide with you. May his power and presence be with you in everything you do. May it bring him glory. That is my prayer in Jesus' holy name. Everybody say amen and amen. God bless you and God keep you this week. Amen. Praise God. Whatever you do, you'll never look at the armor of God the same way. Please leave out Amen Praiser. Exit the sanctuary ex only for those who need to remain to have a conversation. Then do you sit back in your seat. But everybody else please leave and leave social distancing. Amen. Praise God. I gotta take every precaution now. Every precaution now. Please, please take please, please. Oh yes sir. Yes ma'am. One other thing before you go please. Before you go. If you are in need of a if need of a Thanksgiving turkey Platter, bask, uh, per, uh, Thanksgiving turkey basket. Please write your name, write your name on a piece of paper. And there is a basket in the lobby, basket in the lobby in the foyer. Please put your name and your phone number on that and put it in that basket. Name and phone number on that paper. Put it in the basket and we will add your name to the list. We will add your name to the list. All right. God bless you. Amen. Greet each other virtually. Give yourself a virtual high five, virtual hug, uh, a social distance hug, social distance high five. God bless you.